Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Sustaining Sustainability. I'm your host, C.B. Bhattacharya, Professor and Director of the Center for Sustainable Business at the University of Pittsburgh. This week, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined from San Diego, California, by Jacqueline Kerr, a behavior change scientist, writer, mom, entrepreneur, and burnout survivor. Jacqueline is in the top 1% of most cited social scientists, according to Web of Science's list of highly cited researchers from 2014 to 2021. Her work on health interventions was included in the CDC's Community Prevention Guide. She is the host of the podcast, Overcoming Working Mom Burnout, and offers many free resources on spotting employee burnout. Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me today. Of course. Jacqueline, could you speak to how your personal purpose was shaped by your experiences with burnout and how that purpose has shifted during your career? Of course. Actually, my first career had a lot to do with the topic of this podcast in terms of my research focused on building healthy communities, empowering communities to advocate for change through resident leadership academies. And even I was on the California Livable Communities Committee for the AARP because age-friendly cities have been so important. But I did all this work through research and as an academic who fully funded myself and my team through my research. And it really was not sustainable. Actually, once I had experienced my own burnout and as a mother basically trying to be a full-time researcher with all the faculty expectations that you understand of okay. service and teaching, plus this really large research um, agenda and group, and also being a mum, my son was being diagnosed on the autism spectrum at the time. That was an added thing that I needed to work on getting him a better education system. And it was very challenging. So it was only after I experienced burnout that I came back and then looked at the data in academia about the motherhood penalty that mothers in academia face and the impact on our publications, which is how we're assessed for performance, is huge once we become a mother. And we're having equal numbers prior to that, equal to any dad or man. And it can take almost 15 years to make up that gap. So it is really something that's part of the system. So with my systems change knowledge and my personal experience of burnout, I'm now really focusing on that. How can we change how workplaces operate to prevent burnout in all groups, but women in particular are being affected by this. I think that's an absolutely laudable purpose. So how have you seen the move to remote and hybrid work in the last two years affect burnout, employee engagement, and a management's ability to spot burnout? Right. Well, I think remote work, if it's really well thought out and has a basis in equity, it can prevent burnout. Many employees want the flexibility but unfortunately, there's this big disconnect with the C-suite who want to be back in person. So there isn't the same investment in intentionality. But I think the biggest problem is in the last two years, that remote hybrid option has coincided with COVID. So some of that flexibility has actually resulted in increased household and caregiving workloads for mums and therefore a lot of burnout. Now, as we're moving to that phase of remote work without COVID, it really gives people the opportunity to manage their stress on their own terms. But there is also then this Zoom and meeting fatigue, um, which again can be managed if you have better guardrails around what are the purposes of meetings and if you have fixed hours where collaboration and meetings are going to occur and plenty time for focused time without meetings. For managers to spot burnout, I have a four-stage process for this. It is based on someone's behavior, their personality, whether they belong to a marginalized group, and the conditions you have in the workplace. Whether you're remote or not should not change your ability to spot that. So in terms of your, your personality, if you're from a group that's more likely to be burning out, and if you have those conditions in the workplace that lead to burnout, those are all things you can know whether you're in a remote or in person. But for remote, how do you spot if behaviors start to change? And again, that's where we need 
personal check-ins, or in fact, there's one company has um, a mental health Slack channel where even the CEO is sharing that they're feeling burned out. So if you're intentional about it, then there are so many other ways that we can still continue to check in and, and spot burnout with our employees. So interesting. So relating it back to our center, um, we have a work stream called Workforce 100. And in that uh, recent Workforce 100 work stream strategy primer, we asked, what is the business case for creating fair and thriving workplaces? How would you answer this question and what can business leaders do to burn out proof their teams? Right. Well, to me, health is a prerequisite for productivity and fairness is a prerequisite for innovation. Both of these are impacted by things like lack of autonomy, lack of reward, values conflicts. So in my mind, DI, wellness, leadership development, they all overlap with burnout. And so if you can address burnout as one of your central features, you're going to have less turnover, you're going to have more diversity, and you're certainly going to have more engagement. I've created six different burnout profiles that have solutions at the individual, family, team, and organizational level. Really, leaders need to stop thinking about solving burnout with kind of perks and band-aids and really create the environment where we can make progress on these issues. So environments that have psychological safety, a learning and growth culture, healthy work habits. And then I have sort of four guides for companies, which is think about focused, fairness, flexibility, and purpose. So in terms of what companies can be thinking about organizationally, we're talking about four day weeks. We're talking about meeting free days. We're talking about equity reviews instead of merit reviews. And we're talking about well-being as a key performance indicator. It has to be central so that we can really show these effects on turnover, diversity, and ultimately productivity and engagement. That's great insight. Jacqueline, uh, and that leads me to my next question. As you know, we are facing existential crises like climate change and how to transition to a more just society. So how can business leaders engage their people with these overwhelmingly difficult topics without them becoming burnt out? Yeah, and I, I think that's such an important question. And I actually really enjoyed an analogy that I heard, which is, simply work on the brick in front of you. If you imagine that all these problems are a huge brick wall, and if you're working on the brick in front of you and someone next to you is working on theirs, that we will make change. But actually, I think there are some great advantages to embracing the complexity. And in my science, coming from public health, we use the social ecological model that can help you to do that. And it basically says there are different levels of influence that we need to not only realize those things are influencing us, but that we can influence on them and that we actually have to intervene at these different levels. As I mentioned, you have to intervene at home, in the family, in the workplace and society at large. But I think when you start to accept this big macro and micro, when you can see the trees and the forest at the same time, you start to have a lot more compassion for the barriers you're facing, and compassion for others who are facing barriers. Because if we think about behavior change as something that's actually quite difficult to do, we can have a lot more compassion when we understand the barriers we face to behavior change. But also we can start to say, okay, what are the root causes? What are the systemic solutions? And when you start to do that and see all these problems at these different levels in these social ecological models, you suddenly go, I have lots of options. I could intervene at the home or the family or the workplace or in society. And I understand that when people are advocating for causes, that can definitely lead to burnout. But again, I, I think it's so important that if we can see that you know, all these things are in fact are connected as well. For me, wellness and equity are connected. So rather than seeing them as these larger problems that can't be solved, if we see these problems that often have very similar root causes, when we start to solve those root causes, we will be solving many more issues at the same time. So I think that can also help with the overwhelm. So many 
corporations are including ESG metrics, environmental, social, and governance metrics, uh, reporting in their sustainability planning. Uh, could you describe how burnout and employee wellness relate to DEI initiatives, which was uh, what we were discussing in the prior question, and the social success of a business? Sure. So I think there's something really fundamental we have to understand about burnout, which is burnout can be caused by bias, but also when you're burned out, you can be treating people with more bias because the bias that is sort of the main super highway of our brain, it takes energy to interrupt that and to mitigate. And so when we're in um, burnout, we've seen studies, for example, from physicians that have shown they become more racially biased when they're in burnout. And then if we actually suggest individual solutions for burnout instead of these multi-level solutions, that really, again, perpetuates further bias because we already know that there are inequalities and stigma related to how we access healthcare and self-care in society. So if we focus on those things, then yes, burnout and DEI are very interrelated. A big part of burnout prevention is giving people fulfillment. And the more that companies are related to social causes and doing social good, the more uh, engagement employees have. There's a recent book, when, when Women Lead, by Julia Boston that's come out and showed that women founders are often the ones disrupting and creating systems change. And there's more people in society wanting to work for those types of companies. In fact, employees themselves are making calls for this sort of change. Our social license to operate will increase the more women are in leadership positions, because I think they will allow more collaboration and a community engagement and equity. So when that becomes more of the norm, I think this influence of our social license versus our business license, you know, we'll see that companies stand out more when they do that. Also, when we think about the governance related to the ESGs, I think the companies have a really important role in advocating for worker rights like paid leave. And if the government could provide paid leave, then this is going to be supporting companies' employees. So I think they have an important imperative to take action on those types of issues as well. That's a point well taken. Now, your work highlights gender inequities. How do workplaces affect genders differently? And what things can leaders do with their organizations from the top down to improve gender equity? Yeah, I, I think it's so important when we think about where we're at at the moment in terms of DI metrics and really that there hasn't been enough of a change that people want to see. And again, because it's we're still in this mindset of fixing the person instead of fixing the system, rather than just having DEI leaders who have no authority within a company nor investment, you know, we need whole teams of DEI leaders. We need to empower them with having things like DI and well-being as part of our key performance indicators. We know it's things like the hiring process that we need better pools of candidates, structured interviews, clear criteria. But actually one of the biggest losses we're seeing is in women leaders. That's where they're coming out of the system. And again, that can be due to things like the maternal wall or burnout. And that's really when women are feeling that they're not valued and not rewarded. And again, all these statistics that we can imagine for women are so much worse for women of color. And again, things like achievement logs that you use all the time versus self-appraisals, because again, research has shown that the self-appraisals are going to consistently disadvantage women. As we think about our remote work as well, really think about the impact criteria of people's work not just their kind of presenteeism. And I think we need to change the reward systems because that's, again, in our behavior change science, if you reward the behaviors you want to see, then the system changes. So if we start to reward the things that women do better, potentially, which is collaborating, they spend more time on team well-being. They spend more time on diversity. Yet in McKinsey and Lenin's latest report about women and the workplace for 2022, basically we're talking about the great breakup because women are leaving companies because they're not being valued and rewarded. 
And when you look at what companies use as performance criteria for employee evaluation, the majority, 93% reward on business goals and less than 50% are rewarding on, I mean, all the way down to like about 25% are rewarding on career development, employee wellness, DEI, or even retention. And until we change the way we incentivize and reward, then we're going to have this problem in the system of not having the opportunity for women to fairly rise. There is so much to unpack here, and we could go on talking for a long time, but sadly, we are coming to the close of our time here together. Uh, so Jacqueline, what call to action would you make to our listeners? Right. And I'm not going to hold back here if that's okay. So really stop with the band-aids. Stop even with the bad advice like self-care for burnout or unconscious bias training for racism in the workplace. We know these things are not working. And there are, there's such clear playbooks for what to do in DI, in burnouts, even within ESGs. But it's about having a genuine commitment, not these empty pledges or branding, because companies are going to lose the talent war and the innovation war. And I think at the end of the day, will lose their, their social license to operate. I can help companies through the business that I work with, which is the human group with two U's in human and also, if you're a leader and you want training in how to lead through change and leverage change, then yeah, contact me at drjacquelinekerr.com to support people who actually want to learn about how do we create systems change in a credible way that's backed by my science. Jacqueline Kerr, thank you so much for taking some time to spend with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And before I sign off, I want to thank you again. Be sure to check out all of our past episodes on our website, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Give us a follow, leave a rating or review, and recommend an episode to a friend or colleague. This podcast is made possible with the help of my colleagues, Chris Gassman, who is Senior Associate Director, Christian P. Ahern, Center Program Manager, and Gabby Pogel, a digital marketing specialist with the center. I am your host, C.B. Bhattacharya, and I hope to see you in a couple of weeks for another edition of Sustaining Sustainability.